Dara. All right, so what we'll talk about today is the third and last part of our site investigation discussion. Uh, the first one was looking at methods of drilling. We saw we have different methods of drilling, whether you're uh, drilling in soils or rocks, uh, and that's to be able to get some kind of vertical profile, either from looking at the progress of the, uh, the, the drill bit to say what you're going through, looking at the chips that get flung back up the hole at you to give some indication of what the material is, or to take samples um, by taking core or by taking other samples. So last time we talked specifically about sampling, about shell and tube samples for clays and silts and for thick wool samplers for sands and how you uh, deploy those. Uh, getting core out of core holes for drilling in rock and how to log that um, and how to instrument holes after the fact to measure pressures and to potentially be able to measure magnitudes of permeability by doing so-called slug tests. And finally, this more modern method of of kind of uh, non-sampling uh, exploration, which is cone penetration testing or uh, penetrometer testing, which measures tip resistance and sleeve friction and the generation of pore pressures and uses those three parameters as an ensemble to be able to discriminate different uh, types of soil. And from those different types of soil, you can infer uh, what their properties might be, or you can actually use the decay or the magnitude of the pore pressures to, to do things like measure permeabilities and their profile. And so the final thing that we'll do today is to talk about um, geophysical methods. And we'll talk about four in particular, I guess, uh, methods that use the magnetic properties of the earth, those that use the electrical resistive properties, both DC, as in resistance, but also electromagnetic and AC electrical, such as um, ground penetrating radar. We'll use, talk about methods that use the seismic velocity, the acoustic velocity of rocks as a discriminant, and ones that measure the local variations in the gravitational attraction, the constant lowercase g that you use for acceleration due to gravity, which indicates uh, the density basically, or the presence of voids beneath your feet because they don't have the gravity that would there be there otherwise. So we'll talk about those as methods of being able to um, define the stratigraphy uh, within the subsurface. And then we'll talk about deploying uh, sonds in well bores to be able to pick up by running this sond exactly what the geophysical characteristics of the rocks in the well bore are, such as their uh, magnetic properties, their electrical resistance, their acoustic velocities, and their density, uh, just by using this non-invasive methods. And so those are the, the methods that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, you've seen this figure before, I think. Uh, basically the idea that we'd like to be able to say something about this site that you're standing on, that you have absolutely no idea what's underneath your feet. And uh, we'd like to be able to define the whole behavior of this material and its variation, its heterogeneity. We know that heterogeneity, say in permeability, is a big feature in defining uh, dispersion, you know, transport characteristic. And so typically what we would do is we would drill boreholes uh, at a number of locations to be able to look at what is present in those boreholes and then maybe infer that between those locations, we have uh, say sand, and below that we have clay, uh, and we ground truth it against the information that we get from drilling these holes at a couple of different locations. And so we'd like to be able to get that stratigraphy uh, everywhere, not just in the locations that we have the, the boreholes. And so to fill in, uh, one way to do that is to be able to use geophysics. And I think this probably gives you the best kind of idea of that, is that if you're looking at taking a single borehole, that borehole certainly gives you an absolute view of what's in the subsurface. If you sample material, then you really do know what's there because you physically got it in your hand. But if you look at the relative volumes of this relative to the entire site that you might want to define, if this is 10 centimeters, you know, four inches, um, and this site is 100 meters on edge, 
then this is a tenth of a meter, so that would be a thousandth of this length, a thousandth of this length, and if it's a uh, hundred meters deep, it'd be a thousandth of that. So this is the proportion of a single sample is something like um, a billionth, right? Ten to the three cubed, uh, ten to the nine, a billionth of the total volume of the site. And so that's not much of a view of what's going on in the site. And so what you'd like to be able to do is to be able to fill in between the individual boreholes. You have, may have 10 or 15 on a site. If you looked at the Smithville site, you saw all those individual dots were individual boreholes, maybe only going down 10 meters or so, 30 feet, 40 feet, uh, but kind of peppered over the site. Uh, and there, the use of geophysics is less because you have enough penetration to be able to figure out what's going on. But if you don't have that, then one way to fill in between those locations and to make up for this deficit in the fact that you only really have a sample that represents a tiny fraction of your site is to be able to use these proxies, geophysical proxies. And all they do is they say that um, certain soils would have a particular uh, magnetic signature. And if you can measure that magnetic signature and directly associate it with that particular soil, then you're able to move from the ground truth that you have with boreholes to fill in the gaps between them. Basically, that's what's going on. So we'll talk about each of those four methods in turn. Uh, the first are geomagnetic methods. And it really relies on the fact, probably if we go down, I'm reaching across because I scroll on my trackpad, which is over here. Uh, and I guess I need to move your fate, your, I guess I'll get rid of this. So the idea is if, uh, as you sit on the earth, um, because of this uh, magnetic core that we have in the center of the earth, it sets up a magnetic field and the lines of that magnetic field are kind of skewed through that core. It's symmetric on both sides. And so this magnetic field has a certain structure to it. It comes, it's oriented vertically at the poles, but it's inclined where it comes in at other locations. And so if you measure changes in that magnetic field, if you can sense those because of something in the ground underneath your feet, then you have potential to be able to say exactly what that material is. And so this is the basic idea, is that the magnetic field has some overall orientation at the location where you are. I think where we are at about 40 degrees latitude, it's something like an inclination of 60 or 60 degrees. And the lines of field strength are bent to preferentially go through things that have high magnetic susceptibility or potential. Iron, in other words, iron components. And so they'll preferentially go through here. And so if you like, it kind of depletes the magnetic field in the zone around it and concentrates it in the zone in, through which that goes. So if you imagine walking across this with something even as unsophisticated as the magnetic detector that you see people using on uh, beaches, then you get some kind of profile in terms of the magnetic field. And that profile would vary depending on whether you're four meters above the ground, holding it above your head, I guess, two meters above the ground, a meter, half a meter, or two tenths of a meter. And you can imagine that if you walk across a, a piece of land where there's a bunch of um, iron drums, hopefully not with bodies in them, <laughs> sitting below the surface, then you pick up a signal. And if you're kind of remote from it, then the signal's quite diffuse, you get a signal, a change by the fact that you get this concentration of the field directly above this point. But as you get closer to it, then the, the signal you get becomes progressively more and more detailed. And as you get right on top of it, you have these peaks and valleys which represent individual components and the lack of individual components between them. And so the idea is that you can perhaps use this to be able to figure out exactly what's going on in the, the subsurface. Both um, qualitatively, that there is something there, I guess you'd say from this, but also quantitatively as to how deep it is and what it might be. And so that latter part is addressed by this idea, and that is if you have a target which is below the surface, then because the magnetic field is slightly inclined where we are at some uh, location, instead of having a, a symmetric pulse, which I guess would look like this, the Gaussian curve of these parts on either side, it gives you a skewed curve. And if you can locate the peak and the trough and measure the distance between those, then that gives you the absolute depth of the target 
which is a half of that length. So immediately just by looking at that and trying to figure out exactly where that is, uh, you can do that. So in other words, I suppose on this, that would be potentially trough peak. And if you know this individual length is here, you have the ability to be able to figure out exactly the distance to whatever you're looking for is half this individual length at some location that you take as a, as a reference. Looks like you take the median point here as the reference per se. So that's the basic idea. So it's quite limited because it'll only tell you if there are old cars or iron drums, uh, med, uh, steel drums in the ground. But that, of course, could be a useful thing in charting out the, the subsurface characteristics of a site, at least whether something like that is, uh, is there or not. And magnetometers come in two forms. One switch are very accurate that can read down to one nano Tesla and define the direction of the magnetic field, which would be magnetometers that you physically put on the ground. And those which are uh, much less accurate, proton magnetometers, I think they have a coil that applies current to a, um, a, a fluid with hydrogen ions in it, it could be water, it relaxes and measures the spin change in those uh, hydrogen, uh, those protons within the, the system. And from the time it takes for that to happen, it gives you some idea of the strength of the local magnetic field. And so these uh, are used to be able to wander across uh, the ground. I think I looked up on before for magnetometers. Typically, it's something like this. I guess I was probably better off with the previous one, right? The idea is that it has this uh, container that is electrically charged and allowed to relax. You put it some height above the ground, you take a reading, you walk to your next location, you take another reading, or you just walk automatically and uh, you use GPS attached to you somehow to automatically record your traverse as you go across something and you end up with a profile that you're allowed to define as this to be able to define the location of components in the subsurface. So that's uh, magnetometers. So sometimes used in these kinds of investigations, but obviously of somewhat limited use as it's only really a little monochromatic in terms of what it can do. Uh, the second of the methods that we wanted to talk about was electrical methods. And electrical methods fall in a couple of different categories, both DC methods, direct current methods, which are you apply current and you uh, measure the DC properties of the subsurface, or AC or electromagnetic methods, which are basically um, radar methods. So using the same idea as a microwave with a, a transmitter, not to heat something, but using it in the same way that radar is used to pick up airplanes, it reflects off a target and it gives you a distance to that target. Of course, that target, instead of being an airplane, could be um, a, a, an interface between two different strata in the subsurface, which allows you to be able to define its location and what the materials are on either side. So we'll talk about each of those. And I would say that in terms of electrical methods, there are some exotic electrical methods and electromagnetic methods, but the two main ones are either DC methods, DC resistivity methods, or, or ground penetrating radar. So in terms of uh, DC methods, the idea is pretty simple. Um, it uses as a proxy um, the electrical resistivity of the subsurface. And so in the same way that we think of Darcy's law your device battery is low. I hope that's not my, I guess it's my tablet that I'm using, but I think it'll be okay. So we know that Darcy's law is volumetric flow rate, is hydraulic conductivity, and area times a gradient of potential. Um, if we write out Ohm's law in that same way, Ohm's law is a voltage is equal to resistance times current. And so current is equivalent to this. So if we write this up as uh, current is equal to voltage, actually it's change in voltage times one over resistance. Resistance, one over resistance is con conductance. And it's not by accident that this is a hydraulic conductivity. 
that in Fourier's law is a thermal conductivity. This is a conductance that links the voltage to supply to the current that uh, is driven as a function of that potential difference. And so uh, Ohm's law, we usually think of it in terms of a resistance. So a circuit, a resistor in a, in a circuit has a resistance, which is defined in terms of ohms. But we're interested in the resistivity, the apparent, I think this is apparent rather than specific. So a resistance is the resistance of a component, a single value in terms of ohms. But we'd like to know the resistance per unit length flowed of a piece of rock. And that is the apparent resistivity, which is in ohm meters. And so if you have a resistance of one ohm meter for something that's a meter long, it's uh, resistance for 10 meters would be 10 ohms, right? 10 times one ohm meter. And so that's just a way of normalizing it as a resistivity that represents the behavior of this particular material. And so the idea is pretty straightforward. Um, you take uh, a 12 volt car battery and you put, should I check whether someone needs to come into our, um, let me just check to see if someone's waiting at the door to get in. Not really. Uh, yes, Bob Swart, and I don't know who Maury is. Okay, we've added two more people. Uh, if only I can find my other stuff. Okay. And so the idea is that you have a, a 12 volt battery, you have a piece of rebar you could imagine, it's usually more sophisticated than that, that you put into the ground, you attach some crocodile clips to it, and so you're putting current into the ground. You take a voltmeter, and you have some other electrodes that you place into the ground between them. And you measure for a given uh, current that you apply between here. So you apply a certain current between here and you measure the voltage drop delta V between here. And because when you put this current into the ground, just like uh, groundwater flow, another form of potential flow, it has a pattern the flow as it goes from high potential to low potential. If you can measure the current drop between here and then say vary this, the spacing of these electrodes to make them wider and wider and wider, you can get some idea of what you think this flow field looks like just by sampling it along the surface. Because you know the drops, you know from flow nets that the drop between here, each of these is an equitential, so there's a drop of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. So the drop between these should be one, two, three, four, four trials. You know that from, from flow nets. You've done in other classes and also in 303, if you've been in 303. And so the idea is if you can sample here the current that you put in, then you can define the form of this distribution. You could also imagine that if you had a, a layer in here that happened to be a really high conductor, like steel, for instance, or some uh, place where the re resistance, sorry. Uh, no, don't, don't do that. So some location, I remove that. So you want, um, so if the resistivity is low, then the conductance would be high. And so if you imagine a high conductance layer, then you'd imagine instead of having this flow pattern, you could imagine the flow pattern look, might look something like get into this layer quickly, spend all your time in this layer, and then go up. And so it fundamentally alter the distribution of this flow pattern. And you should be able to sense that if you move from location to location. So that's the basic idea. So in other words, you put in a given current from using a 12 volt battery, you know what that current is, you measure the voltage drop at some location, so you get both the voltage and the current. The, uh, the ratio of those gives you some kind of apparent resistivity. Uh, but what you'd like to know is to correct it from the fact that it's not really a standard geometry, such as this would be like measuring Darcy's law. It's a standard geometry, and you could figure out exactly what the resistance is for measuring the flow rate for a given um, potential gradient without any geometric connection. But here you have a geometric correction to apply. 
And so the mode in which the sampling is done are a variety of different um, configurations, referred to as a Schlumberger array, as in the uh, oil services company. The Schlumberger were a couple of French brothers who started off doing electrical resistivity surveys, a Venner array, which is a different geometry, and so-called dipole-dipole method. So the, all that changes is that you take the current inducing electrodes, A and B, and you take the voltage measuring electrodes, M and N, and you physically expand the array. So in other words, you do it with a 10 meter separation, then you do it with a 20 meter separation, and you move everything in the same proportion to be able to do that. And then that allows you to physically, you can imagine that if you're getting these wider and wider apart, you're looking further and further, deeper and deeper into the, the surface of the earth. Uh, the Venner array, you expand them at the same rate, and a dipole-dipole array, the, um, the, the current electrodes are on the outside, and the, the voltage measuring electrodes are on the outside. So just different configurations. So from this geometry, you can calculate a coefficient, which is K, and you can multiply the measured voltage and the current at that particular geometry to give you a specific resistivity. And you can use that specific resistivity in two ways. And you can use it, this kind of schematic shows really what it is. You can use it either to map or to sound. And so mapping, the idea is you take this array with the current on the outside and the voltage on the inside, and you physically move it from location to location as a template making one measurement as you go down, say, the length of a, a pers pers perspective highway that you're doing the site investigation from. And if you plot this specific resistivity at each point where you make this measurement, then you have measurements here, 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 here. And so the fact that you go over something and you're sampling at some appropriate depth, which is depending on your spacing, it gives you some appreciation of some feature that you go across that if you know what the magnitude of this uh, resistivity is relative to this, perhaps you can make a discrimination between what these two different materials are. But certainly you know that there's something there and maybe you put a drill hole down on that to be able to do that. So that's what mapping is. So it's doing a traverse to be able to figure out what's going on. Perhaps less common on hazardous waste sites because they're not so big. The more usual method is uh, sounding. And so the idea is that you take this uh, template and you do a sounding at one particular location by using the temp template. And then you expand it without moving it, expand it laterally. And so you can imagine that, that the smallest separation is kind of sampling a region like this. And so it's getting you a, a resistivity of sp specific depth. When you make it the next one, say this one here, then you're sampling at a new depth. And then when you make it the third one, again, you're sampling at a new depth. And so if, as you expand these, you plot the resistivity that is equivalent to some, each of these individual locations at the appropriate depth. So in other words, you take this separation between these, you divide it by two, and that's the point you plot here. You take the magnitude of the resistivity you get from using um, rho s is equal to whatever your geometry and uh, separation is. I think it was voltage over current. You measure each of these, you know this from the geometry, so you have this and you have exactly that. And so where these two things cross, you have this. You expand it, you get another one, you expand it. And so this is almost like a drill log. It gives you the variation resistivity as you go down within the hole. And so you'd think that this material here has this appropriate resistivity. And so if you bin these two into the same resistivity, you might think that this, this stuff here is all the same material. And again, if you know exactly what this resistivity is, you can make guesses as to what the materials would be. So it's quite a, a, clever, a clever method to be able to use. So that's uh, DC electrical resistivity um, measurements and either in mapping mode or sounding mode. Uh, you can imagine how you could use it to pick up high conductivity, electrical conductivity components like drums, 
uh, or polar plumes, which have some signal to them as well. Um, and I guess we've made all, all of these individual points. So the important thing is that you have to have some kind of contrast between whatever the uh, apparent resistivity is. So apparently the apparent resistivities for garbage are 20 ohm meters. For gravels and sandstones, it's 1,000 ohm meters. For clays, it's relatively low at 33 to 30 ohm meters. And so if you want to be able to discriminate between any of these, obviously, if it's all the same, even if it's different materials with the same apparent resistivity, then you have no chance of being able to, to discriminate between different components. So you need to have a contrast. So that's an important thing in being able to use this. And I guess this is just an example of exactly that. Um, you do a profile where you change incrementally the length of the separation between the uh, current electrodes and the voltage measuring electrodes. You expand it, you plot those magnitudes, and you convert that into a profile, which is done exactly the same way that we, we just talked about. And so the key, I think, is to be able to have um, a contrast in the different res resistivities. And you see that they change over a few orders of magnitude, right? They can be as low as almost in a single digits. They can be as high as a few thousand, depending on the different materials. Um, I think because elect uh, water is a conductor, uh, being saturated or unsaturated makes a fair bit. So you can use it to pick up things like the water table, for example, you could imagine. Um, and again, it's just a method of being able to interpret um, what happens within the, the subsurface. I guess the problems would be that sometimes if you have very thin layers, because of the resolution of this, you don't, might not pick them up. Uh, the second is that you can have a so-called hidden layer. And that would be that if you did have a layer that happened to be a very high conductivity or low resistivity, then it would tend to do exactly this by focusing the flow. And actually, it'd be very difficult for any flow to occur below this. And so you just wouldn't see the material that exists below it, the so-called hidden layer. This would all be hidden because it's just masked by the fact that this has such a, a super high electrical conductivity. And the other one, I guess, is equivalence. And the idea is that it's kind of a non-unique solution. And so if you had some kind of profile that gives you apparent resistivity, oops, sorry, apparent resistivity as a function of depth, which is what this is. This is actually a log scale here, so it looks a bit strange. This plot here is equivalent to all of these slightly different profiles. And so if they're slightly, only slightly different from each other, then you might not be able to decide which one is the most logical. Of course, the, only, the best way to, to figure out which one makes sense is to have, um, okay, well, I've lost my, uh, I've lost my um, path. It really was true that I was down to, to low, uh, low, low battery. Well, I won't charge it up here. And the other way you could use this is you could use it not so much in sounding vertically, but you could use it azimuthally. So we know that fractures in the subsurface are something that we're interested in because they allow fluid to be conducted in them. And you could imagine using resistivity that if they're water filled, they would have quite high conductivities. And so you could imagine doing the same thing with this template, but instead of moving it out laterally, you could just change it in azimuth as you go across it. So in other words, you'd have the voltage measuring pins, You'd have the current uh, inducing electrodes on the outside, and you do a profile across here, and then you just incrementally switch, switch the azimuth. And I think that's exactly the picture that I have here. In the, you can't see it perhaps very well, but these individual stakes here are electrodes. They're just pushed into the ground with a little handle on it. You see another one here. Uh, they're arranged, you can see some here if you've got a good screen and then it's broadcasting well, that they're in some kind of array around the circle. These are the voltmeter boxes and a battery over here, um, electrical line that joins them. And you just do the survey by doing a survey across one at the spacing. You leave the um, electrodes in, you just switch the connections to maybe go through 15 degrees, 30, 45, 60, etc. And you can work your way through the, the system to be able to do that. Um, I think, 
Yeah, okay, that's that's the only one for that. All right, so I've lost my um, pad, so I can't write on it so well, but we'll get by. The other way to do this is so-called um, electrical res uh, resistance tomography, ERT. And so this is an example from Edwards Air Force Base. I think that's where this space shuttle used to land on its way back from uh, orbit and in Southern California, in the Mojave Desert, basically, uh, a groundwater remediation site. And the idea is that uh, you can use thermal methods to be able to either use dual heating, resistance heating of the ground, to be able to evaporate apples from the subsurface, or you can inject hot water or steam to be able to vaporize it and get it out. But the question is, how do you know it's gone? And so one way to do that is to do a tomographic profile with electrical resistivity. You have some wells, which are these components here. Along the wells, you have incrementally um, places to be able to inject current and recover current from the other side and being able to, at some location, be able to measure the voltage all the way through this. And so you do that to be able to now do it all the way through a plane. And you can't see this very well. It was in color, it's in black and white here, but it gives you a contour plot of the electrical resistivity. And if you can identify an individual magnitude of apparent resistivity with say a saturation of an apple, then you can look at the before and during and after plots and say something about um, how well you're doing in terms of remediating the site. And so that's uh, one way to be able to do this. I'm looking at my phone just to see what the time is. So it's 2.10, right? So we've talked about um, magnetic methods, eh, not so much used, but clearly to pick up drums. We've talked about DC electrical methods, uh, which are quite heavily used because they're quite sensitive to the parameters which are important to uh, contaminated sites. Induced polarization is where you turn on a current for a period of time and then turn it off and you look at the decay of the voltage as that occurs. It's mainly used for large scale exploration for ore bodies and not so useful for um, contaminated sites, and so maybe we won't spend too much time dealing with that. Electromagnetic methods, uh, for large-scale electromagnetic methods is the same way. You have a coil from a transmitter that puts a low-frequency electromagnetic signal, a radio wave signal, uh, which gets put into the ground as well as the atmosphere. Uh, if you have an electromagnetic source, um, a secondary source, like for instance, um, an ore body, then this transmitted signal, electromagnetic signal, radio wave signal, uh, sets up a secondary field as a result of this conducting source. You try and pick this up on the surface and then you can map exactly what's in the, the subsurface. Just by taking a profile of the secondary field strength along the surface, you can plot out exactly what that profile looks like and try and make a guess as to what is present there. But again, it's something that's not so useful for what we use. And these transmitters actually exist in lots of places. They what um, uh, submarines use to be able to locate themselves and to be able to signal because low frequency radio waves are unlike high frequency signals are much more sustained. They can transmit through water uh, and into the subsurface water. And so submarines can pick up radio signals even when they're submerged. And time domain electromagnetics, I'm, I'm going to avoid that as well. So magnetic methods, we said, uh, partially important. Electrical, magnet, electro, electrical methods divide themselves into two forms, mainly DC methods, which we've talked about, but also ground penetrating radar uh, as the second widely used one in uh, surveying uh, contaminated sites. It works on the principle that if you have a radar transmitter and a receiver that sit on the ground, then the transmitted wave will go through the subsurface, bounce off any interfaces, and you basically measure a time of flight from transmission to receive receiver. You half that time of flight to represent basically the, the depth of the layer. And when you pick up this return signal, um, you can use it to be able to say something about the depth of that interface. And so you need two things. One, you need it to reflect off an interface. 
And so you need a contrast in the individual properties of that uh, material. And so the appropriate material property is um, uh, the dielectric constant. And so if two materials have a different dielectric constant, then they will reflect the signal back, right? Just like the dielectric constant for a metal aircraft and the air it's in are different. You get a signal for an aircraft. And um, the velocity, the transmission velocity, is close to the speed of light, but the transmission velocity is also a function of the material that's there. And so you need two things. You need to be able to have it reflected to be able to get an interface. And once you know what the two-way travel time is, if you know what the uh, velocity is in that particular material, you can calculate the depth of that interface. That's really basically the idea. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, putting radio waves, into, uh, microwaves into the ground, the depth penetration uh, can be a problem. And it depends on the individual material you're going through. Clays are quite impenetrable and uh, ice is actually quite penetrable and, and rocks are quite penetrable but that controls the uh, behavior. Sometimes the presence of water, which has a high dielectric uh, coefficient, confuses things. Um, and the other thing is that if the depth penetration you get is not what you want, you can control it by changing the frequency. So if you reduce the frequency of the uh, antenna that you use, make it a lower frequency, typically you'll get a larger depth penetration. So this is, um, basically the idea. And so let's look at this. This is just a, a trace from running a signal. It's actually the place, if the background on the screen is of me and Mucklock Annie right now, this is exactly where this is from. This is from Norman Wells. You'll see the date on it at the bottom as well. This is a radar trace from taking a transmitter and receiver and moving it across the surface of three meters of river ice on the Mackenzie River. Uh, and this is the profile that comes from this. It's basically a graph of horizontal location, if you like the x direction in this direction. And in the vertical, it's um, a travel time. I don't know if you can see it very well, but this represents 200 nanoseconds, 150 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, 50 nanoseconds. And if you look at these traces that you see here, this is a, a bounce back signal so this signal here has taken 200 nanoseconds to be picked up at the receiver after being transmitted from the transmitter. And if you look at the stratigraphy it picks up, it picks up some kind of signal along here, right? You see, maybe you can see something here. This is this stratigraphic component here. You see quite a strong signal a, a reflector here, which is this, which is this here. And you see one here, which is inclined. And so these signals um, are coordinated with a drill hole that went through here. And the drill hole went through three feet of river ice. It went through some water before it went into some sand at the, bo at the bottom of the river, Mid River Mackenzie, and it went into clay beyond that. And so the idea is that you can ground truth it against the borehole that you have, and then, but you can also then extrapolate it in areas where you don't have that information. So that's the, the, the basic idea. And so, as I mentioned before, the two things that are important are that for any material, you need to have a dielectric constant. And so we see that is ice on here. I guess I don't see ice on there. But if you have a, we had gravel. Uh, we don't, I don't even see, we had wet sand. Is 25, do we have clay? Well, clay could be in the same region, right? So clay could be five or it could be 35. Clearly if clay and wet sand were the same, then you wouldn't pick up much of a contrast to be able to discriminate between them and then it wouldn't work. So this gives you the strength of this individual reflector. And if you know what the velocity is of that particular material, then you can use the two-way travel time to be able to convert a travel time into a distance, right? Uh, Travel time is just length over time. And so you can use the travel time to get the length out of that, okay? So uh, geomagnetic methods, electrical methods, both DC and radar are techniques that are used. Seismic methods uh, use the idea that if you can pick up and define contrasts in acoustic velocity, 
the wave speed in rock, then you can use that as a discriminant to be able to pick up both the stratigraphy and also define exactly what those materials are by interpreting exactly what the wave speed is. Um, and it works in two, two main ways. We can either run what are called refraction surveys or we can run reflection surveys. Um, the mechanisms by what happens to an acoustic wave is an interface. So if you stamp on the ground or you have a small explosion, the sound waves that go into the ground have three options when they hit an interface. An interface is something that has a different acoustic impedance and an acoustic impedance is the product of the density and the acoustic velocity, so-called acoustic impedance. So any material that has a contrast in this product will cause three things to happen. It will bounce a wave back off it, just like light uh, reflecting off a pond. Angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. It will allow a portion of the energy to be refracted along the interface, uh, often in the higher velocity, higher acoustic impedance layer. And it will also diffract a layer according to kind of Bragg's law that is no longer on the original travel path of the wave, but is at some skew from that. And the idea is that we can use either the reflected wave or the refracted wave uh, when it comes back to the surface to be able to say something about the characteristics of the subsurface. And so this is the basic idea in this, this figure here. So you decide that you're going to put some energy into the ground here by either stamping on it, hitting it with a hammer, surprisingly is the way to do it, or having a small explosion. You put some geophones at, unif at different uniform separations along the surface of the ground. Uh, you put this energy into the ground and then you allow that seismic energy to go into the ground and to get to the other receivers which are present on the surface. So to do that it has a couple of different options. It can travel directly there through this material here. Uh, which is fine, that will be the first arrival. Or you could imagine if this material here has a velocity which is quite high compared to this material here, which has a velocity that's quite low, you can imagine that it might prefer to go down to the fast layer along the interface and then come back up to this. And this will be faster than it going all the way here through the slow, slow layer. So the idea is that you can use seismic refraction to go, instead of going on the country road to get to this point, you go on the country road to get to the interstate, the interstate gets you there quickly, and you arrive here earlier. And so it's the same for these acoustic waves. So seismic refraction works in that way. You record the first arrivals of each of these geophones, um, and the earliest arrival would be the closest geophone, the latest arrival would be at the most distant geophone, and you plot a time of arrival versus location of the geophone plot. So in other words, this plot here would basically be, oops, I forgot that I can't do that. This would be the x-axis, and this would be the time axis. So in other words, this plot here would be exactly that. And if you look at that here, that's exactly this idea, is that for the close in geophones, it's faster to go directly through the slow velocity layer. And this is the portion, the first arrivals would then look like this. But once you get beyond this critical length here, it's faster to go down into this faster layer along here and then pop up through here to get this point. And so after this point here, the refracted wave would be slower than the direct wave. The direct wave would arrive later. Sorry, the refracted wave is faster than the direct wave, which the direct wave would arrive later. And so you can use this to do two things. One is the slope of this graph gives you the velocity of this material here. The slope of this graph gives you the velocity of this layer here. So this would be layer two. This would be layer one. And so you can get the velocities of these two layers, but also the fact that you know this location here, this gives you the thickness 
of this particular layer down to that second one. So you get both the stratigraphy of this site and also some idea of the uh, seismic velocities. So if you do that with all your geophones laid out on the site to be able to get the seismogram, you can imagine having a shot applied here and you measure the time of arrivals at all the geophones relative to that. You leave all those geophones in, now you shoot at this location and then you measure the arrival times at all the geophones again. Then you get, imagine getting a plot of time and distance graphs like this. You can use the slope of this uh, time distance um, plot to give you the velocity of the layer. And you can use where it changes from one location to another to give you the, the depth of these individual layers. So the interpretation of this curve would be that you'd have some kind of weather bedrock, has channels in it, soil sitting on top of it, um, it's saturated to some layer, and then it's unsaturated above that. And so typically, if you have a, a good enough contrast between the seismic velocities, this would be 1700 meters a second, this would be 35 or 3600, you can pick out this interface. As the seismic velocities become more diffuse and closer to each other, you might not be able to pick them out. Typically, the difference between saturated and unsaturated seismic velocities is not all that much. And so you might be lucky to pick out the location of the, um, uh, the water table. Okay, I see we're at 225. And so that's the basic premise of seismic refraction. And so it uses a direct wave for a portion of it, but most of them are refracted waves. And that used to be, and perhaps still is the most common use of running seismic surveys. Seismic reflection used to be the way that you ran these surveys in the oil industry. And the difference with the oil industry is that instead of looking at a site which is perhaps 20 meters deep or 30 meters deep, maybe you're looking down three kilometers, five kilometers. And the idea is the spacing of the geophones on the surface is not so large, but the depth you're looking at is very large. And so the, um, uh, the aspect ratio, if you like, of having the, the ray go down and come back out, it's not spread out broadly. It's much closer to this behavior on the left-hand side. And so the only option is that if this, uh, if your seismic array is at two kilometers here and you're looking down uh, five kilometers, then you're only going to get reflected waves. The, the refracted waves aren't going to mean anything. And so you have to use it in that particular case. And so it was usually used in the oil industry. Now it's used in environmental and geophysics as well. Because now the problem used to be, if you're looking at the, the reflected wave, that's very fast. And so the machines didn't have enough sensitivity to be able to pick that up. But now it's used in the same way. And so you can imagine this being a time distance plot. So this is a, a two-way travel time. This is the location on the surface where the geophones are picking these up. And you can think of this just like the, the ground penetrating radar survey, that this is a two-way travel time. Uh, if you know what the two-way travel time is and the velocity of the material, you can calculate a depth for each of these interfaces. And as you know, as you're going from left to right, this is how the depth of that surface changes as you go from location to location. So in other words, you can get a plot like this and try and interpret it in terms of what you think is physically um, in the subsurface. And so that's seismic methods. If you look at... Um, how that's used. Um, well, I guess I didn't talk about radar, but that's fine. Um, so ways of doing this. So this is the beautiful island of Montserrat, and this is the town of Plymouth, which in 1995 was a real town of 6,000, 7,000 people, um, pristine Caribbean town, uh, until uh, Sufir Hills volcano started erupting. And ultimately, all the volcanic ash that was deposited upstream of this washed through the town as uh, lahars and basically buried the town. Uh, and this, I mentioned drilling in Montserrat before. This is a, a ground penetrating radar survey to look at uh, the profile. So this would be a transmitter. This would be a receiver. Uh, they're on skids. You uh, move them. Um, together the, the same separation distance to be able to um, profile the subsurface, and then you reduce the data in the same way that we, we talked about.
it's exactly then on the, the surface being used uh, either at different separations or by just uh, moving them at the same separation across the, uh, the ground. Uh, we talked about seismics. So this is a geophone. All it is is a, a little pot for a scale that's probably two inches uh, across, so an inch and a half. You would have on the bottom side of it a spike. The spike goes into the ground and all it is is a coil with a uh, magnet inside it. When it gets shaken, then the magnet moving in the coil creates an electric current and that electric uh, current gets picked up as a signal, an arriving signal. Um, all of these individual geophones are attached onto a main trunk line. This is just crocodile clips, putting it onto this line that picks up the signal that joins all the geophones together. Uh, you lay out a line, you put in a seismic signal into the ground uh, by hitting it with a sledgehammer as being one of the options. Um, when the sledgehammer makes contact with an, uh, a steel plate, it completes a circle circuit so it defines the moment of impact, which gives you time zero. And then you can interpret the arrivals of the P wave, the compressional wave at each of the geophones, and you can interpret them in the way we talked about. Yeah, it's tender. And you see here the cable laid out with all the individual um, two component connections per geophone to attach into a single trunk cable. And that's Chuck Amen from Geophysics. Uh, uh, in dike building. This is uh, pretty old now. This is 1980s, a 40 year old um, uh, seismic box. Each of these individual two knob pieces is an amplifier. There are 12 of them. It's a 12 channel seismograph that takes 12 geophones on the cable that comes out of here uh, and records it um, digitally, even in this case. These are some other uh, geophones. This is a single geophone. You see it's slightly different shape from what I suggested the other ones are, but the same working behavior, a glove for scale, individual crocodile clips that clip onto the main trunk cable. Um, the main trunk cable, this is a site in the western, in western Alberta, in the eastern Rockies, I suppose, not very far from Jasper, Alberta, if you know where that is. Uh, the instrument being used with a jacket on top of it to cut out the sunlight. And instead of using a um, hammer, in this case, as a seismic source, this is a quarter stick of uh, gelignite um, with a blasting cap in it uh, in, a, in a pond to provide uh, good coupling. Yeah. So those are seismic uh, instruments. The fourth of our methods is our gravity methods, uh, not seldom used in environmental geophysics. It works on the principle of Newton's law of gravitational attraction, the, the gravitational acceleration, what we call G, 9.81 meters a second, give or take, is proportional to a gravitational constant, Newton's gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and the radius of where you are on the Earth. We're on the surface, so it's whatever the, the radius of the Earth is. Uh, also, though, it says that the gravitational force between a body of a given mass is given by this constant. And so if you have, if you can measure the force, gravitational force on the surface, if a mass is missing, then you can imagine that that gravitational attraction should be changed in some way. And it's kind of shown in this schematic that if you had a hole in the ground, where there was, which was a cave, then the gravitational attraction of a mass to that thing would be less because it has less mass. And so if you're, if you're measuring the force by the stretching of a spring, the spring would be less stretched here than it would be where the mass is there. And that's the principle of all gravitometers. It has a very sensitive uh, measurement of uh, stretching of a spring with a mass in there to be able to see what the local magnitude of this acceleration due to gravity is because it varies from place to place. And so you can imagine that if you set up an instrument that could measure gravity very accurately at each of these locations and get a profile of this reduced gravity, it, you could surmise that something is going on in the same way here. And actually it's a bit like magnetic methods. If you know what the location of the signal is and the shape of it, you can try and make 
some calculation of what this anomaly is. The problem being is that a small um, hole, if you like, that's quite close to you tends to have the same signal as a much bigger hole that's deeper. You can't discriminate between those. So it becomes a bit ambiguous. It's not widely used in contaminant hydrology profiling, just because it's, if you know there's a hole there, I guess you could use it in karst limestone, where you might want to find caverns. But other than that, it's not so useful. And the other problem that makes it uh, difficult to use is that the sensitivity of the measurement, this is a very small variation that you're measuring, and that variation is also conditioned by other things. It depends where you are on the globe, it depends on latitude, it depends on whether you're at a thousand feet or zero feet elevation. It depends whether you're on top of a mountain or in the plains. Uh, it's influenced by earth tides um, due to the, the moon and the other planets going around us. And uh, obviously it picks up density variations in the subsurface. So it's not something that's broadly used. So those are the four methods. Uh, magnetic, electrical, DC and GPR, um, seismic, reflection and refraction, and um, gravitational. Those are all used on the surface to be able to discriminate between what's going on. Um, and the other thing that you could imagine doing is that you could use tools in the well that you've um, uh, drilled. And so maybe it's worthwhile making this note again that the reason that we're doing this is to be able to have some drill holes and maybe to fill in between those drill holes exactly what's going on. And so we can only define what's between those drill holes if we can link up the material here with what we've seen in drill holes. So really we need to know not whether this is a sand or a clay, but we need to know what its uh, apparent resistivity is or its acoustic velocity or its density for gravity and use that to be able to figure out exactly what, um, how that relates to the, the other proxy that we've measured with our geophysical signal. And so we might want to be able to measure those four kinds of signals for those four kinds of um, techniques to be able to figure out exactly what the material is between our locations. And to do that, we might use um, borehole geophysics. And the idea is that you just take a sond, and perhaps I'll go with this first. A sond would look like this. And so a tool, uh, maybe in terms of dimension, maybe this is a couple of meters long, uh, obviously less thin, uh, less diameter than the borehole. And you put this on a wire line and you just lower it down the hole at a constant velocity. It would measure what it's measuring. Uh, you'd record that signal on the surface. Maybe you'd record the same signal coming up and choose between them or average them, but you'd have some measurement along the full length of the borehole and you'd use a particular tool to be able to measure a particular property. And so we said that the four properties that we're interested in uh, are magnetic methods. So you want to measure uh, magnetic potential for um, electrical methods. Uh, DC, you'd want to measure resistivity or conductivity for um, Radar methods, you want to measure dielectric constant. For seismic methods, you want to measure acoustic velocity. And for gravitational methods, you want to measure densities. And so the tools do exactly that, and they use it by some proxy. Uh, so the different tools would be uh, a gamma ray uh, survey, which measures natural gamma ray counts, which are typically uh, tell you whether clays are present because they have natural radioactivity in them. A density log, which uses a cesium source to pick up uh, the changes in density along the length of it. A neutron log, which measures, has a, na a natural neutron source that sends out neutrons um, that get backscattered by water, hydrogen molecules, uh, water molecules, hydrogen uh, protons. And that backscattering tells you something about the moisture content. Uh, electric log measures the electrical res resistivity. Um, a salinometer measures electrical resistivity in just the pore fluid. You can measure temperature with depth. You can use measure sonic velocity, an acoustic log. You can measure how the um, diameter of the well bore uh, changes. So in areas where you have collapse, you might uh, 
be interested in, you might use as a signal for change from a strong material to a weak material. I think we talked about the idea of having a flow meter or a spin, spinner, spinner log, or a log with a very small impeller. You drop it down the hole, it spins, it gives you the relative velocity of water that flows past it. You drop it down the hole, you pull it up at the same rate, you subtract the signals, and it tells you if water is flowing into the hole somewhere and then flowing out of the hole somewhere else. And deviation just measures the deviation of the hole from the vertical. And so if you can imagine running each of these tools along the length of the hole, you'd end up with some signal as a function of depth down the hole. And so if you measure the density along the hole by dropping this density tool, it'll give you some signal. If you also measure the gamma, natural gamma ray background, if you measure the electrical resistivity or its inverse, its resistivity along the hole, those signals, if you combine them together, give you some way to be able to interpret these individual profiles with some particular stratigraphic uh, progression. So if you know what the acoustic velocity, um, there is no seismic log on here, I guess, but if you knew that the uh, electrical conductivity of um, saturated sands was much higher than, or saturated silts was much higher than saturated sands, then you could make some interpretation of what's going on. But I suppose the other thing to bear in mind is that if you have all of these signals that give you all of these different um, contrasting characteristics, you have more constraint on your problem because you can make sure whether uh, the interpretation that you get from using one signal matches up with what you'd expect from the other signal. And so you can invert these in some smart way to be able to figure out what's going on. You don't do that the software that uh, interprets these signals does that and then kicks out a number. And so, yeah, so these are the various um, songs. Some have a, a bowstring on the, the side to keep it pushed up against the borehole wall. So you get a good connection, a good contact. Uh, some would measure the changes in profile of the, the caliper log to see how the, the diameter of the hole changes as you go along it, so-called caliper log. And, um, and they measure the signal automatically. And I think these are just uh, tables that talk about some individual signals. So if you want to be able to use this, obviously the proxy that you use, acoustic velocity, electrical conductivity, density, or magnetic potential, there has to be some contrast in these between the different materials you have in your section. And so the applicability of these different methods um, to different things um, is shown here. So often applicable are the, the dark dots, sometimes applicable are the light dots and not used are the, the blanks. And so in the ones that we've talked about, we talked about reflection and refraction. Um, sonar is for bathymetry, talked about gravity, we've talked about magnetic, um, and we've talked about resistivity, and we've talked about um, naming GPR. Uh, I'm not sure the difference between electromagnetic and radar is here. Radar seems more populated below. And the ones that we didn't talk so much about are this, and radiometrics, and we did talk finally about borehole logging. And so I think that's probably the last slide before we start talking about remediation.